Once you forget about plot conveniences and how cool everything looks for a second, it becomes obvious that almost no futuristic facility in the history of movies could possibly serve its intended purpose in real life. If we take what Wikipedia says is the Jedi Gospel, the Death Star has a diameter of 160 kilometers, or 99 miles in the American Freedom System of Measurement. That means that the outer layer of the Death Star has a surface area of just under 31,000 miles. So what are the odds that the one space garage Luke and Han get pulled into is within walking distance of where Princess Leia, an incredibly valuable political prisoner, is being held? That would be like looking for a single person in the entirety of a small city, landing at a random airport, and finding her in the baggage claim. Luke and Han are in and out of the Death Star in maybe an hour. According to the official Death Star dimensions, it's still 99 miles from one side of the station to the other, and that's if you cut straight through the core, and I'm pretty sure you can't because there's a big fat reactor right in the middle. Odds are they'd have to be traveling along the circumference of the station during their search, which is 310 miles. Even if those turbo lifts were moving as fast as a commercial jet, it would still take them a little over a half hour just to ride completely around the station without stopping. Meanwhile, in the same amount of time it takes Han and Luke to find Leia, rescue her, escape the garbage chute, and make it back to the Falcon, Obi-Wan gets the tractor beat controls and back on foot. The controls, by the way, have less security surrounding them than the firearm switch at an elementary school. The Death Star has a surface area of Lake Superior, yet every critical area of the station is located within roller skating distance of the hangar that the heroes of the Rebel Alliance land in. Vader must just really hate walking around on his Franken legs. In Face Off, the movie where John Travolta chops off Nicolas Cage's face and steals his child, we're told that the prison, located on an oil rig out in the middle of the ocean, is the most sophisticated correctional facility in the world. Its remote location makes escaping it virtually impossible, and all the inmates are required to wear giant magnetic Super Mario boots, which can be activated to root them to the floor at a moment's notice. That's... that's not a joke, by the way. These are actually the boots from the Super Mario Brothers movie. Anyways. If you go to a Supermax prison in real life, they give you tissue paper shoes for the explicit purpose of preventing you from using your shoes as a murder weapon. But the island prison in Face Off, built to house the most dangerous criminals on the planet, gives all of its inmates giant steel hulk feet that can easily be used to stomp a person's head into pie filling and or kick a Shawshank hole through stone and mortar. Which is exactly what happens when a riot finally breaks out. Yet for some reason, during the ensuing melee, the guards don't bother to turn on the magnets, which was the entire purpose of giving the inmates dangerous robot shoes in the first place. Apparently no one was covering the magnet boot switch that day. Also, after murdering his way through the riot, Nicolas Cage just leaps right off the oil rig, which is easily a 100 foot drop directly into the ocean, and swims to freedom. For all the good being in the middle of the ocean did them, they could have built that prison in the middle of Disneyland and it wouldn't have made a difference. The spaceship in Alien, the Nostromo, is a state-of-the-art 22nd century spacecraft that is somehow less efficient than a Carnival cruise ship. First of all, it looks like a medieval torture museum where all the fire sprinklers have gone off. Seriously, every inch of this facility is covered in water all of the time. We're talking about a bunch of blue-collar astronauts and a billion-dollar star freighter. Water's a precious resource in this scenario, and the fact that virtually every surface of the vessel is perpetually damp has to be some kind of problem, right? You could probably bring down the International Space Station by spilling a juice box in the wrong place. And look at what the hell is going on in the room where Harry Dean Stanton gets ambushed. There are gallons of water pouring from what appears to be a skylight on a spaceship out in the middle of the galaxy with almost no functioning overhead lights. For whatever reason, the Nostromo rolled off the assembly line looking like a haunted castle and everyone at the factory said, yep, yeah, that's right. It looks like he wandered into a tool video. Secondly, they make it a point to let us know that the Nostromo's escape shuttle can only hold three people. The shuttle won't take four. Yet the ship is crewed by seven. Why would that ever be the case? Who would design a ship with a lifeboat that couldn't hold everyone on board? Didn't we get all of our ship building hubris out of our systems back when the Titanic sank? I think this company put spookiness way ahead of employee safety. In J.J. Abrams' Star Trek reboot, Nero is a Romulan from the future who accidentally travels back in time after a solar flare destroys his planet. Now he's all full of space angst and he wants revenge, which is perfect because Nero's ship appears to have been built by the exact same people who designed that floating murder palace than Astromo. Everything about it looks less like a sophisticated mining vessel and more like a Swiss pornographer's memory palace. Also, yet again, there's water everywhere. Why is there water on all of these spaceships? Furthermore, the interior is laid out like a honeycombing skyscraper with absolutely no railings to speak of. In the show, every time the Enterprise takes damage from enemy laser blasts, the crew get tossed around the flight deck like socks in a dryer. So what's gonna happen to Nero's crew when their ship gets attacked by space pirates, or if they suddenly have to hit the brakes and make a hard right turn? Every Romulan on board would go rocketing off a hundred foot balcony to their deaths, and then Nero would be all alone. The company responsible for building Robocop, Omni Consumer Products, OCP, has their headquarters in a futuristic skyscraper that was apparently built using dream logic. In one of the film's first scenes, we see the OCP bigwig showing off Ed 209 in a boardroom meeting on the top floor. However, 
As we see in a later sequence, Ed 209 can't navigate a staircase, and he's carrying the arsenal of a tank. So even assuming he weighs as much as a small tank, that still puts him between 20 and 30 tons. Unless they assembled Ed up there piece by piece, they'd need to have installed a special kind of freight elevator just to carry him to the top floor. And that's not even accounting for those 20 to 30 tons stomping all over that penthouse boardroom like the Iron Giant and step up to the streets. What skyscraper can take 30 tons of localized impact on an upper floor? They'd have to evacuate the building every time he took a step. The police station is equally confusing. Later in the movie, we see Robocop visit their computer archives, which for some reason has a terminal that can only be accessed by Robocop, and then only if he punches it with his data harvesting dagger fist. Even more baffling is the fact that several people try to stop Robocop from entering. If he's not allowed to be in the police archives, why did they install a terminal that only he is capable of operating? That's like building a hall of records written in a language Billy Bob Thornton invented. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching the video. Why don't you go down to the comments and let me know what you think the most confusing movie facility ever made was. And not one that I already mentioned because that's cheating. But try to one-up me, if you can. If you want to embarrass yourselves. You want to fight? You want to fight me? You want to fight Tom? Let me know in the comments. I'm right here.